Like I said, tonight's, uh, tonight uh, is, uh, false religion is uh, Islam, and so we're going to talk about that. So Galatians chapter 1, verse starting at verse 6, uh, going through verse 9, it says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto, uh, unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some, uh, some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ, for though we or though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Verse 9, as we said before, so say I now, again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Let's flip over to Psalm chapter 77. Psalm 77, and we're going to start at verse 10, and go through verse 15. Verse 10, the Bible reads, And I said, This is my infirmity, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy works of old. I will meditate also of all thy work and talk of thy doings. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary who is so great a God as our God? Thou art the God that doest wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength among the people. Thou hast with thine arms redeemed thy people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. Like I said, tonight we're going to talk about the religion of the false religion of Islam, and the different, uh, you know, the difference and the differences between them and Christianity as well. One of the things that you'll hear all the time is, you know, from a Muslim is, is that Allah is one and Christ was just a prophet. Allah is one and Christ is just a prophet. That's one of the reasons, you know, why they, what they, uh, and you'll see the reasons why here in a moment. The, uh, Islam is the fastest growing false religion. You know, I don't know why. Because they have more children than any other religious, uh, religious group out there. They have more children, so more children means that they can uh, you know, raise their kids to be more Muslims. And because of that, that's, that's how when they go into a country, and I say invade a country because that's basically what they do, because what they'll do is they play the victim when they go into a country, say everybody hates us, and then everybody feels sorry for them. And you know, during this time, they're having children and everything else, and then they begin to grow and grow, and then before they know it, the country is overrun by Islam, and then that country is forced, basically, into Sharia law, all that because of the fact that that nation now is, has become Muslim just in a few generations or so. But they, uh, they, have, uh, it, they claim to have 1.9 billion followers as of 2020. And this is in various countries throughout, uh, throughout the world. It originated in Saudi Arabia, and from there, it expanded along the trade routes to Africa and Asia. The country with the most Muslims, who wants to guess it, is Indonesia. See, you guys probably were thinking oh, it was going to be Pakistan or any of those kind of, you know, Afghanistan or whatever. No, the one that has the most Muslims is Indonesia with 120 million. In addition, there are millions more in the, in the parts of Eastern and Western Europe and in the Americas. One out of six humans on the face of the earth, is a Muslim. One out of six. They span from, uh, 62% of Muslims live anywhere from Turkey to Indonesia. In that area, that's where 62% of them live. But like I said, one out of six human be uh, beings on the face of this earth is a Muslim. The word Muslim literally means submission. And what they mean, submission to Allah, the God of Muhammad, the man who founded this religion. Muhammad is their prophet. He is the highest prophet that they have. Um, a believer in Muhammad's religion is called, obviously, a Muslim, meaning one who lives life according to God's will. So who is this Muhammad? We've talked about Muhammad a little bit before. We, you know, we've went through some of this stuff. So I may, not, um, I may or may not you know, hit on some of those areas that we've already talked about. But Muhammad was born in Arabia in the city of Mecca in 
uh, 570 AD. He was a member of a highly respected, prominent family, and his mother died when he was six years old. So his grandfather ended up raising him, but he died when uh, Muhammad was nine years old. So he was then raised by his uncle and worked uh, herding flocks. As an adult, Muhammad got into the caravan trade because that's one of the ways that it, you know, obviously this is spreading. But the caravan trade is meaning what? That they're taking different spices, they're taking different things back and forth, different commerce back and forth so they can make money. So he got into the caravan train, uh, trade and went on trips to Syria and Persia. Scholars believe that in his travels, Muslims, or sorry, uh, sorry, Muhammad developed his concepts of monotheism or the idea of one God, uh, that, that you worship one God and that's it. Unfortunately, the thing is, is that what he had learned about monotheism or the one God, they were all wrong. Okay? From, you know, and this is from several sources. There was a group called the mono, uh, Monophysites who believed that Christ had only a divine nature. He was only, he was only divine, and that's it. You'll hear some Christian groups say that, that he was, only, he was only divine. He was only God. That's it. And what they say, basically, is that he was just a spirit going around, that the spirit of his, you know, the idea of, of Christ and everything else, that he was just literally a spirit, and that's all he was, okay? Then there's also the Nestorians, who divided the incarnate Christ into two separate natures, divine and human. They said, you know what? He's divine and human. So what they would do is that that was uh, in one person. But the, here's the thing. They would deny that the man Jesus was both fully God and fully man. And obviously that's what Christianity believes is that Jesus Christ is both 100% God and 100% man. You say, how is that possible? Because that's 200%. You know what? We can ask him when we get to heaven. That's how the Bible always portrays them, you know, is that way. But the way that they, uh, you know, the way that these other ones, they would either say he's divine or that he's, he's both, but he's, you know, but, you know, they're not together. You know, he's not fully God and fully man. He's like half and half. They also believed that he absorbed a great deal of teaching from the Jews. So they're talking about, you know, that uh, this is uh, uh, Muhammad here, that he got a great deal of teaching from the Jews who exposed them to the Talmud, we talked about before uh, what the Talmud teaches. The Talmud you know, teaches that Jesus Christ is burning in hell in his own excrement. That Mary, you know, you know, that Mary uh, was a whore and that Jesus is the bastard son of Mary. That's what the Talmud teaches. And so the Jews also you know, helped Mo, uh, you know, Muhammad in, the, uh, in these areas of his hatred towards Christianity. And as a result, it is unlikely that, obviously, that, that Muhammad's opportunities to learn about the one true God came in great part from anyone who really understood the Bible because he went to everybody else who told him, and they were all false. They didn't actually go to a Bible, he didn't actually go to a Bible-believing person. This is the reason why he gets it mixed up and say, well, the Christians, are, uh, they're not worshiping the one true God, they're actually worshiping three gods. And so he doesn't understand it, and so that's why he ends up going on, you know, this way. But even the, the Muslim writer Caesar uh, Farah admits that Muhammad's uh, narration of the scriptural events shows that he could not have had an educated uh, knowledge of the sacred scriptures. So the, the thing is, is that by reading his stuff, even though you know, Muslim scholars will say, you know what, he, didn't, he had no idea about the Bible. He didn't really understand it, didn't really go along with it, because a lot of people say, well, he just believes a little bit differently than we do. Yeah, no, he believes a lot differently than Christianity. And it's a, totally, it's a completely different religion, a false religion at all, uh, completely. It's no wonder that obviously Muhammad developed theological flawed ideas, right? Which he later expressed when developing the Quran, which is their holy book. In the caravan trade, Muhammad gained the attention of a wealthy, uh, of a wealthy widow named uh, Khadijah. When they married, he was 25 and she was 40. Okay. Now, mind you, later on, and I've told you this before, but I'm going to bring it up again. We're going to find out here in a moment that Khadijah dies. So, later, uh, what ends up happening is that there's this woman that's probably around the same age as Khadijah that comes along his path. So does a six-year-old that comes along his path as well. And he says, I don't know, you know what to do. I, should, I don't know what, you know. Uh, what to think here, you know, what should I, who should I marry? The 40-year-old or the 6-year-old? 
He talks to his housekeeper. The housekeeper says, it is good that you marry both of them. Now, if you marry a six-year-old, what does that make you? A pedophile. Muslims are like, how dare you? And, and those that are, he was not a pedophile. That, that was allowed, you know, back in the, you know, in that time. It was okay. It has never been considered okay. It has never been. You know, but Muslims will say that, well, back then. And they, but, you know, here the thing is, they'll, they'll tell you to your face. They'll say, well, back then, that's how that was. And, you know, we don't really agree with it. But what you don't realize is that in the Quran, it's, to them, it's okay to lie to an unbeliever. They still believe this. They still believe that it's okay for a man to marry a six-year-old or a three-year-old or whatever it is. But then they'll say, well, you know what? He didn't consummate the marriage until she was nine. You're still a pedophile. You can sit there and say, well, I didn't do anything to her until, you know, and that's by you saying it, trying to cover yourself. But you know what? She's still nine years old. She's not mature. You know, I mean, no place in the world had, has ever condoned as, you know, pedophilia as being a good idea or something that was culturally acceptable. But during their marriage, I go back to, you know, that's a little tirade because you can see where this religion is going, all right? It's very, it's very wicked. But during their marriage, Muhammad, this is when he's married to Khadijah, Muhammad spends most of his time in solitary meditation. It was when he was age 40, he received his first revelation or first vision when he was contemplating in a cave on Mount, uh, Mount Hura near, uh, near Mecca. Muhammad says, and this is what we, you're going to see some similarities between Islam and Mormonism. Obviously, uh, Islam came a lot, a, lot, a lot sooner than Mormonism. But he says that the archangel Gabriel came to visit him during a dream and brought the following command. Now, this is the command. It says, read in the name of thy Lord. This is out of the Quran. Read in the name of the Lord who created, who created a man of blood coagulated. Read, thy Lord is the most, the most, benefit, uh, more, most, benefic- uh, most beneficent, who uh, taught by the pen, taught that, that what they knew not unto men. From out of this command to read comes the actual name for Quran, which means the reciting or the reading. You know, the reason why is because Muhammad could not read or write. The Quran is, is him reciting the revelations that were given to him. Somebody else wrote it down for him. Is there a problem there? If he can't read or write, how are you knowing what the other person is writing? If, whether or not it's actually it's the same thing that you read. But of course, obviously, we know it's a false religion in the first place, but... Because, I mean, we just know, you know from obviously what the Bible says, but here's, the, here's, the, here's also, if you want to, uh, for further uh, confirmation that it was not of God, Muhammad afterwards was deeply disturbed you know, from this whole event about meeting the archangel Gabriel, which that's who he says it was, but he actually says this. He says that he was deeply disturbed and told his wife, who thought, this is what his wife, Khadijah, thought, who thought he might be possessed by gins. You know what gins are? Demons. You say, well, Pastor, you're just kind of like put, superimposing that. No. Later on, you know, uh, we'll find out that the, you know, they have a name, obviously, for Satan and demons, and demons are gins. Supernatural beings, you know, this is our supernatural beings in Arabian folklore. Do you think that he was visited by demons? I think he was. He was out there, you know, meditating and everything else, waiting for something. And then he even says that he felt weird afterwards, like somebody took over his body. That's called demon possession. But she also assured him that his words were true, even though they came from demons, that they were true. And then, as did his other family members. They all said, you know what, we understand that these may have been demons, but your words are true. And upon the urging of his wife and family, because they, you know, they said this is you know, of God, a false God, but he began to preach in the, tree, uh, in the streets and in the marketplaces in Mecca. Now we know that Mecca is a big place, has a big, you know, a, you know, a big position in Islam is Mecca. And you'll, we'll see here in a moment why uh, they believe that. 
But he, you know, here's the thing is, Muhammad never claimed to, to be divine, but he insisted that Allah had called him to be a prophet. It's amazing that, you know, he doesn't, you know, consider himself divine. He never writes down anything, can't read anything, but yet he's like, you know what, but I'm going to be a prophet. And much like Mormonism, you're going to find out that it's not just the Quran, but they have other teachings as well that they go off of because, you know, you got to add to it. In other words, when there's an error found and somebody goes, hey, there's, something's inconsistent here, God's not, you know, consistent, he's got to help out the false god by saying we've got to try and make it a little bit more consistent. So he's got to add to it. So what he does he, he, in his preaching of his lifestyle and beliefs to the people, much like Mormonism, and you're going to see this with a lot of false religion, it brings them opposition. But the only reason why they didn't kill him is because he had an influential uncle that protected him. But in uh, AD 620, his uncle dies. And there was many plots were made to kill Muhammad and his prophets. So Muhammad uh, was forced to flee to uh, uh, Yathrib. And this departure is called the, the Hijia, or the, yeah, the Hijia, and marks the beginning of the Islamic calendar. So you have all these different things that are going on, and what he would say is that he was being persecuted, that he was like a martyr, you know, that he was going on there. I mean, he, wouldn't, he wasn't a martyr because he didn't die yet, but he was going, he said, I was persecuted because, you know, you know, this is what happens to, you know, the people that follow God, right? Or follow Allah. And his depart, you know, or sorry, and then uh, Yathrib, uh, Muhammad, be, uh, become, uh, he becomes the religious and political leader of the city. So when he's there, when he, when he flees from there because of all the, you know, because people want to kill him and oppose him, he eventually becomes a leader in that area. Much like you'll see with all these other false religions is that they have such, you know, maybe it was because of his charisma or whatever, but they have this charisma that, gets, that puts them in, the, uh, them in powerful positions and then they're able to take over the entire area. Because whatever they say goes, right? So the people of Mecca organized an army. Not in favor of him, but to try to destroy Muhammad and his followers. But the Islamic forces were triumphant. You see this nowadays. That's the, that's the way they make converts. I mean, think about it. You come up, you have a person on their knees, you have a gun to their head, and they says, are you going to convert to Islam or you're going to die? What are they, you know, what is a non-believer going to do? They're going to sit there and say, I think I want to convert. Even if they don't mean it, they're like, I want to live. So Muhammad you know, enters Mecca and destroys every idol, uh, idol in, uh, in Kaaba, the main temple, except for the black stone. It's a sacred uh, meteorite that's enshrined there. So that's the reason why Mecca is, you know, and, and Kaaba, and the, that whole area is considered sacred because they went in there and they, he destroyed all this stuff. But the thing is, is that they, Kaaba is not a Muslim temple. It's a pagan, you know, I mean, you know, their religion is pagan too, but it's a pagan religion. It's another religion. So they take over it. They keep the black stone, and then they begin to, you know, worship the area because that's what you always do is that, you know what, hey, you know what, why destroy the temple? You know, let's just go right in there. This is our most sacred thing. So Muhammad then declared that Kaaba is the, is the most holy shrine of Islam. That is you know, that Kaaba's right there. It's got the black stone. If, you see, uh, if you've ever seen pictures of it, it's like a giant cube. It's like a giant black cube that they will go around. And then since that time, uh, it, has been, uh, it has been the spot where all the devout Muslims direct their prayers. So they will pray five times a day, and all their prayers, like they will sit there, and if you ever get like an a, like a Islam, Islamic you know, app on your phone or anything else, it will actually direct you to where that is. So that way you can pray in that direction, towards that. So it's all about your direction towards you know, that as well. So from there, he obviously was strengthened in his position as the leading prophet and ruler of Arabia. Because why? Because all these people came and he fought them off. His armies, his armies you know, ended up uh, winning there. He unites the tribes in a vast army to conquer the world for Allah. But here's the thing, Muhammad dies in six, uh, 632 A.D. But you know what? This doesn't stop Islam. It actually sparks the spreading of Islam across the world. So let's look at some of the teachings of Islam. 
Obviously, the Quran is the, considered the most sacred uh, scriptures in all of Islam. It is about four-fifths of the length of the New Testament, and it includes 114 chapters. It is a mixture of Muhammad's dictated words, he said that he had received from God, and the writings of his disciples who remembered his oral teachings after he died. Isn't that convenient? So who's to say that, what his, that they didn't have their own agenda when they were going about this? And that's assuming that if you believe that Allah, it was actually, or not Allah, but you actually believe that Muhammad was a prophet of God, you also have to believe that these other ones are too. And that they're actually remembering correctly or they have some sort of agenda in mind. And by the way, pretty much everything in the, uh, in the Quran argues against itself. They'll say one area that it's good over here. There's one spot where it says, um, this is paraphrasing, but they basically you know, they say to leave the Christians alone, the Christians and the Jews alone, because they're, they're your friends. And then another spot it says, kill the Jews and Christians because they are the infidels. So which one is it? So much of the uh, Quran, jumps, like I said, jumps around from uh, one place to another and doesn't follow any kind of narrative. It's a bunch of just random writings that he just writes, or, well, sorry, that he speaks and somebody else writes. Muslims claim that it was copied from an original Arabic, which is in heaven. Sound familiar? Like, Golden plates from uh, Mormonism? There's all these like secret things. Oh, I got golden plates, but they're gone. They went up to heaven, naturally. And this original Arabic, oh, that's in heaven. And besides, you know, besides, uh, you know, the Quran, Muhammad developed teachings and, and sayings, you know, called the, the Sunnah, literally meaning the path or path. The Sunnah became a base for the tradition built on the Muslims, or sorry, on Muhammad. I get Muslim and Muhammad, I'm just mixing those up. Built on Muhammad's conduct as a prophet. The highest honor for a Muslim to have is to live the way that Muhammad lived. Sounds like a very honorable man, right? That takes advantage of a six-year-old. Along with uh, many other things. And basically how he had handled things, you know, while being a guide, judge, and ruler of his Muslim followers. So whatever Muhammad said, that's what, they, that's what he said that God told him, that Allah told him. And they were all, uh, they were all gathered together into uh, one body of work called the, the Hadath. And they used this as a supplement to the Quran much the same way that the Talmud supplements the Hebrew Bible in Judaism, or much like the Book of Mormon supplements the Bible in Mormonism. It's that they have another testament along as they, as they go. And the funny thing is, is that when you have all these, when you have these religions, you know, obviously Mormons don't follow the Bible, they say that they do, but they don't ever read the Bible. Why? Because that's an inferior book to them, because whatever Joseph Smith said, that's what goes. The same thing, you know, with, uh, with uh, m- Muslims is the same thing, is that there are parts of the Bible that they believe, but it's all inferior to the Quran. How, how appropriate, that, you know, how that all works out, right? And so there's another body of teachings uh, in Islam, and this is one you probably heard, you know, all the time, is Sharia. It's a combination of legal interpretations of the Quran and the Sunnah. The Sharia means law, and it lays down a strict and comprehensive guide of life and conduct for Muslims, in which actually that same area says that, you know what, if your, your wife or your, you know, the girl you're, that you're with doesn't listen to you, you have every right to beat her or kill her for her being not uh, submissive enough. So can you see why a lot of women don't ever want to get out of Islam or fear for their life? Because that's what's taught. And it, can, uh, it contains, you know, the prohibitions. They won't eat pork. They won't drink alcohol. And then as well as, you know, there's punishments for stealing, apostasy, uh, adultery, and blasphemy. If you steal something and you're caught, they will cut off the hand, the hand that you don't wipe with. The reason being because in Islamic belief that if you wipe yourself 
with that hand and then you eat, it's like, you know, like you defiled yourself. You're unclean. It doesn't matter the, any amount of soap that you use. It does not matter because you're still considered to be unclean. So that's why they do it in order to, you know, for you to always remember you stole something and that's wrong, right? That's, that's what they believe. Here are six doctrines of Islam. These are doctrines, these doctrines are a requirement for every Muslim to believe. These are like non-negotiables. If you're a Muslim, you're to believe these, and if you don't, you're not. You're like an infidel. Obviously, number one, you know, is the fact of God, that there is only one true God, and his name is Allah. Allah is all-seeing, all-knowing, and all-powerful. And, you know, here's the problem is that, you know, some Christian missionaries will go over to Muslim countries, and they will still call God the Father, Allah, because, well, that's God. No, you're confusing things you're confused well we gotta be able to reach them no only thing you're doing is saying that christianity is just the same as islam and they're not leaving it they're not getting saved what they believe about angels they obviously believe that the chief angel is gabriel who said to you know who said who has been said to have visited muhammad in the first place there's also a fallen angel his name is uh shaitan that's satan and as well as his gins his demons. It's funny that his wife said that you were visited by demons, but we believe this is from God. So how messed up is their idea of God that God would deliver a message through demons? Even though that he said it was from the archangel Gabriel. This is what they believe, uh, you know, as far as scripture, they're at, they, they believe in four inspired books. There are four inspired books. They believe in the Torah of Moses. The first five books of the Bible. So they say that they believe that. And what you'll see is, is that, I always get these two you know, mixed up. Jacob and Esau. That's where, if you think that Islam is something new, it's not. It literally started back with Jacob and Esau. Why? Because they look at it that Esau was actually the firstborn, had the birthright, should have, you know, everything, you know, God, you know, should have went through Esau. But, sin, you know, and they said they don't care whether or not that Jacob swindled him out of his birthright and, and got his inheritance and everything else. They said, no, it should be this way. Whereas the Bible says, well, Jacob got it, right? And so that's where they, you know, the two deviate. But it's been going on for thousands. That's the reason why over in the Middle East and that area over in Europe, they're fighting over that area. They're still fighting. Why? Because it goes all the way back uh, to that time of Jacob and Esau. It goes all the way back then. There's nothing new. Everybody says, well, when do you think there will be peace? There will never be peace over there. Never. Because they've been fighting ever since. So you have the Torah of Moses, and then you have the Zabur, which is the Psalms of David. And that's not all the Psalms. That's just the Psalms that David wrote that they believe. And then they have the, the Injil, which is the gospel of Jesus. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they say they believe. Are you beginning to see a way to possibly be able to witness to somebody, to be able to talk to a Muslim about Christianity? And fourth, obviously, is the Quran. Muslim, uh, you know, Muslims believe, though that Christians have, uh, you know, this is what they believe, that Christians have corrupted their scriptures. Sound familiar yet again, right? Because the Mormons are, are the same way. They say that, you know, that uh, you know, Christians have uh, corrupted them, and so they, uh, Joseph Smith needed to fix them. The same thing with Islam is that they felt like they need to fix them. And so because they've corrupted the scriptures, they believe obviously the Quran is Allah's final word to mankind and supersedes anything, everything else. The funny thing is, is that they believe that the Quran supersedes anything else, but then they wrote other stuff in there, right? So it's, it's. I mean, it, you know, all of us, like I said, when when they find something that is not you know right or contradicts itself, which it still does, but they will write other stuff in there. Muhammad is considered to be the uh, the the last of the great prophets. There was all these prophets, but he's the last one. You can't change it now, right? When it comes to the end times, on the last day, the dead will be resurrected. So they believe in the resurrection of the dead. 
And then Allah will be the judge, and each person will be sent to heaven or hell. You say, well, that sounds you know, like Christianity. Well, let's go a little further. There's predestination that God has determined what he pleases, and no one can change what he has decreed. We believe in that you know, as well, that there are certain things that obviously that you're not going to change. Like the events of the body, you know, like when it talks about the end times, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, and then the, you know, the, the sun's going to be darkened, and all those. Th- those are things that are, you know, that are not going to be changed. You're not going to change it, and all of a sudden God's like, well, nope, never mind. Or the Antichrist coming into power and all those things. They also believe, uh, here's the five pillars of the faith. Obviously, they have six doctrines that, that, that have to be believed, but there are five duties to be uh, performed, or the five pillars that need to be performed. Their statement of belief is this, to be a Muslim... A person must publicly repeat the, the shahada, the shahada, basically saying that there is only one God and Muhammad is his prophet. That's why a lot of times when a Muslim comes up to another, another Muslim, that's how they'll, degree, uh, they'll greet themselves, whether it's in Arabic or whatever. Usually it's in Arabic, but they'll say, you know, um, uh, you know uh, there is only one God and Muhammad is his prophet. They are to pray five times a day. And they must kneel and, and bow in a prescribed manner like, in the Quran, it actually tells them how they have to kneel, and you know all the uh, and all that. And then, like I said, and it has to be directed towards the holy city of Mecca. It has to be. So no matter where they're at, they have to know where Mecca is, and they have to be able to direct it. You know, I don't know that if it. I don't know the reason why. I mean, I don't know if it's like if they don't pray towards Mecca, like their prayers don't go. You know, the, you know, prayers are like un- unanswered, which they are. I mean, they're going to be unanswered no matter what. But it's like, you know, that's what, they, that's what they want to believe. As far as alms or giving, every Muslim must give 2.5% to the mosque. Some Christians are like, man, that's awesome. I, I, church asked me to give 10%. But the reason why they do this, you know, they use it for widows, orphans, the sick, and the unfortunates. So it sounds like, oh, man, this is, a, this is nice. You know, they're, they're actually having all the widows and the orphans and all that. Then Ramadan is the ninth month of the lunar year, and it serves as the highest of the Muslim holy season. This is where they will fast from sunrise to sunset. I've seen some NBA players. I saw like Kyrie Irving. He was playing a game, and he was not allowed to eat because he was, it was during Ramadan, so he was, he was fasting while he was playing. And you say, well, how does that work, you know, as far as being a basketball player running back and forth? Well... He seemed to do all right, you know, uh, you know, when he was playing. And they are required to, like I said, they are required to fast for the entire month. So in that ninth month of the, uh, the, the lunar year, uh, the, the, uh, yeah, the lunar year comes about, they fast the entire month. They are able to eat at darkness. That's when they're allowed to eat, but during the daytime, that's when they don't eat. They also must have a, there must be a pilgrimage to Mecca. They have to go there. This is the uh, this is the uh, is called the Hedge, and must be performed at least once in a Muslim's lifetime. But if it you know, but here's the thing: you say, well, what happens if it's too dangerous for a believer to go there, for a believer in Islam to go? They can send somebody else. It's kind of nice. So let's look at. I'll be wrapping this up. How does the Quran? contradict what the Bible says. For Muslims, God is one, period, right? This is one of the things. They will always attack the Christian uh, teaching of the Trinity. And they say that we're committing blasphemy by the way we're doing it because we're, we're worshiping three gods, not one God. They'll teach that Allah is all-powerful and is relatively impersonal. Here's another thing that they believe is the fact that when you die, that God or Allah weighs out your good deeds and your bad deeds. And if your good deeds by chance are more than your bad deeds, then he will catch you at the last second right before you fall into hell and then rise you up into paradise, into heaven. But if not, he just lets you keep on falling until you get into hell. They also uh, omit the name of Father for God to avoid the idea of the Father and the Son. They don't want to have that idea. They don't want to call Allah Father because then there's an idea like, well, he's a father. He has to have a son. So what does the Bible teach? And and these ones, if you're writing them down, I'm just going to tell you because I'm not going to be able to hit every single one of these points 
or else we're going to run out of time. But the uh, first one I read to you at the beginning of this, mess, uh, you know, of this teaching, which is Psalm 77, verses uh, 10 through 15, and Isaiah 43, uh, 13. These verses, ba- uh, basically, they speak of the greatness of God. And then Deuteronomy uh, 7, 8, Jeremiah 31, 3, Ephesians 2, 4. This is the reason why I wasn't going to read all of these, because there's a lot of them. 1 John 3, 1, and then 1 John 4, 7, which basically says that God is the, you know, is the God of love. That, you know, obviously, the God that we worship is a God of love, right? And he's a great God. They deny that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's not the Son of God you know, to them. The Quran calls Jesus a prophet, but far below Muhammad in ranking. Jesus you know, is, a, is a prophet, but he's, he's low on that totem pole. You can't have him out there, right? But here's what the Bible teaches. Obviously, we know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, right? We can see this, and I'm only going to list a few of these, because obviously it's throughout the Bible. But I'll tell you the ones that are in, um, well, actually, if I do that, then, you'll have, you know, then there will be quite a few verses. But I'm going to tell you a few uh, as far as in the Gospels, because then there you can actually try to help a Muslim to see that he is the Son of God, which is Matthew 8, 29. Matthew 17, verse 5. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. John chapter 8, verse 58. John 10, 30. John 10, four, uh, John, sorry, John 14, 9. John 20, verse 28. Colossians chapter, uh, sorry, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 through 17. And Colossians chapter 2, 9, it speaks, they all speak of Jesus' divinity, that he is God, that, God, he, that he referred to himself. Because they'll say that he never called himself God. He did. Every single time, you know, that, I mean, let's just put it this way. Every single time that the Pharisees get mad at him or the religious leaders get mad at him, it's because he's calling himself God and they don't like it. You say, well, he never comes out and says, I am God. Yes, he is. When he says, before Abraham was, I am he is saying at that point, I am the great I am. I am God. That's what he is saying. The Quran teaches that Jesus, uh, that Jesus never died on the cross. That he never really died, I should say. But that according to them, that Allah took Jesus to heaven just before the crucifixion. They actually say that Jesus put somebody else upon the cross that looked like him but actually it wasn't really him in the crucifixion. But that, then the reason why is because God, uh, you know, Allah would never kill one of his prophets that way. So that's why they don't believe that. So obviously we know that what the Bible teaches is that all four Gospels are filled with eyewitness accounts of the crucifixion. And it's not just, you know, it's not... Uh, I mean, we see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse uh, 2, which uh, you know, speaks of the crucifixion. We see in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, that Jesus himself predicted his own death. That in, in, in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, that Jesus tells us why he had to die. Matthew uh, 26, verse uh, 28, Jesus promised that through his shed blood that there would be forgiveness of sins. So the Quran also teaches that each person must take care of his or own sin, his or her own sins. You got to take care of them yourself. There is no sacrifice that does that all for you, right? Like I said, remember the fact of the Gospels, the Torah, of Moses and the Psalms of David, because those are where you can go to try and reach somebody that's a Muslim. Like I said, the Quran teaches that each person must take care of his or her own sins. They, they earn salvation by following the five pillars of the Muslim faith. You got to follow those. That's how you earn salvation. That's how you get to heaven. I mean, remember the Mormons. The Mormons was that they had a book of commandments or a book, a book of commands that they had to do. That was written by what? Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and those guys. Do you see any, uh, any problem with the fact of how they're going about salvation? You have to do what? You have to earn it. Can we earn salvation? 
No. But this is what you're going to find with every single false religion, every cult, you know, every false church, is that they are going to say that you have to earn your way to heaven. And some of them, they won't say it explicitly. They won't come out and say, well, you have to earn salvation. But they'll say, well, you, you know, it's by faith, but you have to do these things as well. And they'll add on to them as they go. And here's the, uh, this is what they teach is that if they don't make it to heaven, it's your own fault. You didn't do enough. Right? That's what they teach. So obviously, we know what the Bible teaches, right? John 3.16. It's a free gift, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, what, believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So what does that mean? That you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are saved, and you're not going to die and go to hell, but you have everlasting life. That's a promise of God. He made it simple. He did the work because we couldn't do it. Even if we tried to earn our way to, you know, to heaven, there's no way that we could. There's no way. Acts 4.12, that there is no other name under heaven which we are saved than by the name of Jesus Christ. That's it. That's why I find it funny when you have these Yeshua, Yahweh people coming out now. No, the Bible says that there's only one name under heaven you know, by which we are saved, and that is Jesus Christ. It's not Yahweh. It's not Yeshua. That was a sad thing, actually, from this, this past weekend when we went to our you know, Med, uh, Men's Summit, is that I saw men wearing shirts that said Yeshua and Yahweh on it. I wanted to go slap their pastor and say, why didn't you tell them? Romans 3, 23 through uh, 26, you know, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Ephesians 2, uh, 2 4 uh, you know, through 9, obviously part of that, you know, says that for, you know, it is by grace through faith that we are saved. And this is not of our, of our own selves, right? That all, you know, all of these tell that there are only, there's only one way mankind can find forgiveness in this world. That they can get to heaven is through what? It's your faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. All these false religions always will always make it to where, you know, we have to do so much because, you know, uh, we got to keep on working, we got to keep on working, or else God's not going to accept us. But what does Christianity say? Christianity says, I know that you can't do it, God knows that you can't do it, and he says, but I'm going to provide a way for you anyways, because you can't do it. But there's no way, there's no perfect sacrifice. The only sacrifice that was perfect is Jesus Christ, that's it. And when he was slain before the foundations of the world, that provided our salvation. That provided our way. But the thing is, is that somewhere as far as in our sinful you know, nature, our, our sinful uh, way, we always say, well, i got to try and make up for it. I mean, think about it. It even happened with Adam and Eve. You say, well, how did it happen with Adam and Eve? They discovered that they were naked. Did they care that they were naked before then? Did they notice that they were naked before they sinned? No. They were walking around, just didn't... Why? Because that hadn't entered their mind. Everything was fine. But what did they try to do? They try to cover their sin. They got coverings, and they covered the areas you know, that they said is wicked and sinful. Right? So ever since humanity, you know, ever since the Garden of Eden, man has been trying to cover their sin, trying to do it on, its, uh, on their own merits, trying to do it, and then they blame everybody else. You say, I would never do that. Well, you know what? We have that in the Garden of Eden too. It wasn't my fault. It was that woman you gave me. Oh, wait, no, wait, it's that serpent's fault. Oh, wait, no, it's this. And they start pointing fingers every which way around, right? But glory to God, thanks be to God, that he knew that, that we would do all that, that we try to come up with every excuse in the book and said, you know what, I'm still going to, you know, that I'm going to send my son. Jesus Christ going to the cross and dying for our sins wasn't plan B. That was always the plan. There was no backup plan. That wasn't like, oh, man, wasn't really counting on that whole Garden of Eden thing not working out. He knew it was going to happen. And he said, you know what? I already got a, you know, the plan's already been put in place. Everything. Why? I mean, the Bible itself says what? Before the foundations of the world. What does that mean? Before the earth was even created, that plan was there. Jesus Christ, you know, going to the cross for our sins was the plan. He was slain before the foundations of the world, in which that also you know, shows that you know, people were saved in the Old Testament before his, 
before he came to earth to die. Why? It says before the foundations of the world, uh, you know, bef- uh, sorry, before the foundations of the, of the world, he was slain. He was already slain before then. Why? Because in God's reality and in God's thing, there is no thing as time. We always think of time as we have it like on our watch. We're going, man, so much time. But God has no time. There is no time. That's why, it was, that's why when it gets into Genesis and you, and you see Abraham, Abraham, you know, it says that Abraham believed the Lord and it was counted to him as righteousness. He was saved in the Old Testament. You say, well, he hadn't died. You know, Jesus hadn't died yet. Before the foundations of the world, you know, he was slain. So one closing thing, uh, and I close with this, is a key thing to remember when trying to witness to a Muslim. And this is, and I told you to keep on looking, you know, keep on looking in those areas. But this is one of the biggest things that you can do. And you know that, you know, I'm always like, I, I want to go out and just talk. And I'll, I'll talk to a Muslim and everything else. But this is one of the best ways to do it. Is that keep on obviously bringing scripture you know, to them. Because why? Because God's word won't return void, right? You keep talking to them about it. But here's the thing. A lot of times, they're not going to believe that because they believe that it was contaminated anyways by Christians, right? So they say they believe it, but they actually really don't. So witnessing to a Muslim requires time and patience, and this is one of the reasons why you should live out your faith before them, because when you have a steadfast walk with the Lord that displays the nature of God in all that we do, it's going to be that daily walk that is going to bring a Muslim in. They're going to say, why, you know, why are you so much different than I am? Because the only things that Muslims are ever taught by, you know, by the, um, I'm trying to remember, the Amman, which is like the, the priest, is, is that you are to hate Christians. They're never told why. They're sort of told that they hate. And so when a Muslim will see somebody, will see a believer actually living out their faith, then they will they'll sit there and go, why are you different? Why is this? And you can sit there and talk to them. There's actually a lot of Muslims that will actually sit there and start talking to you because they want, they actually kind of want, they want to test and see if the Iman is actually being truthful with them, that these are horrible people and that they need to be, you know, murdered and killed and everything else. That's the reason why, you know, when we have certain missionaries that go to sensitive countries, and I almost said a person's name that's actually in a sensitive country, and I can't do that because we want them to come back alive. But they'll go over there, and there, we've had ones here that have actually went over there, and what do they say that they, they do? is that they come, you know, they get, you know, with them, and they, you know, begin to talk to them because they, they're like, ooh, I've never seen a Christian. I've never seen a real live Christian, especially over in the Middle Eastern countries because it's 99.9% Muslim. And so for them to meet a Christian is like, oh, man, I got to see how they actually really are. Well, that's if you meet the wrong one. That's if you meet the wrong Muslim, that whatever. But there are a lot of Muslims that want to meet you that want to meet like Christians or something like that because they want to see if it's, you know, if what they're being told is true. Because like I said, a lot of the women, there's a, there's a reason why uh, women usually come out of mu- uh, Islam the fastest. You, I mean, why? Think about it. They can't do anything. If they disappoint their husband in any way, shape, or form, he has every right to divorce him, beat him, or kill him. Do you think a lot of women, you know, do you think a woman's actually going to come up and give her opinion if she knows that, you know, that that's possibly going to happen? Now, if she's smart, she's not. And that's what they will, they'll probably say. But Christianity actually, you know, as we, you know, you know, you see is that Christianity actually gave women a voice. A lot of the, a lot of the freedoms that women enjoy nowadays is because of Christianity, especially in America. Because, like I said, you know, we, we talked a little bit about on, you know, on last Sunday and stuff like that, that obviously women are not, um, you know, considered to be unequal. It's like, yes, men and women are equal, but are given different roles, right? They are to do different things. But, like, in, in Islam, it's mostly the men that will go to mosque, you know, you know, the mosque or whatever in here, and the women are not, you know, a lot of times stay at home. And so it's whatever, you know, was, was whatever her husband comes back home and says. And a lot of those marriages are arranged marriages. 